Hello everyone, welcome to Crownet. This is Dr. Navya, oral and maxillofacial surgeon. So before we start our session on cysts and tumors of the jaw, I'd like to talk in brief about solving the MCQs of oral and maxillofacial surgery. The most important aspect of solving the MCQs of this particular subject is to have pretty clear concepts. Once you have a thorough knowledge as to the disease, the course of the disease, and the diagnosis is when you will be able to decide on what sort of treatment is necessary. I suggest you all to start with reading about the topic that is going to be presented on the previous day itself for every single class so that we can have an interactive session where we can just have a discussion on the questions that have been asked previously and uh, the clinical scenarios which will help you guide in deci uh, deciding which answer would be the best option. Uh, the most important uh, thing is the thorough knowledge. Like I said, it's the clear aspects that's necessary, clear concepts. I'd like you all to be thorough with the oral medicine, oral pathology and radiology part of every lesion. So if you're going to talk about the cysts, I would like you to start from the etiology pathogenesis. So that is the thorough understanding you need to know so that you know, you know the course of the disease as such. Knowing the direction of the disease, that will help you decide what sort of treatment is essential as long as radiology, because radiology is very important for us to arrive at a proper diagnosis. Once we arrive at a proper diagnosis is when we go ahead with the treatment plan. So the treatment plan of most of the times, it can just be a wait and watch approach. That is why I say it's important to know the course of the disease. Once the pathology part of it is clear, you would understand if you don't need any active intervention as such, or if you need a treatment as such. When you decide that there has to be a back to treatment, it can be the medical or surgical aspect. In the surgical aspect, it can be the conservative where you don't have to do radical or extensive surgeries, where you just stick to simple treatment, simple surgical treatment that might actually help in better prognosis. Another thing that I'd like to stress right now is once you decide what sort of a surgery is necessary, you need to know the timing of the surgery. For example, in the case of cleft lip or palate, it is the proper timing of the surgery that's needed or even orthognathic surgery, in fact. In case if you try to intervene in a procedure and, and do a procedure in an earlier stage, as in, in a younger childhood itself, that might actually be detrimental and there might be changes in occlusion and it might even hinder the jaw growth. So most important is not only to know what sort of surgery to go ahead, it is also the timing that's necessary. So there has been a uh, different changing trends of patterns of questions that has been asked. But if we have to categorize uh, oral and maxillofacial surgery, questions that have been asked previously, it is either a direct question, which uh, usually tend to have misleading options, or it's an application based question. So uh, let's start off with a uh, with such a question which is application based and let's look at our first question if you have any doubts i'd like to put uh, i'd like you all to put it in the comment box so that we can tend to it and please try to make it as interactive as possible if i ask any questions i'd expect you guys to answer and uh, let's help uh, let's start with the first question uh, a 25 year old female patient presents with a diffuse non-progressive and a non-tender swelling of the right maxilla which is approximately 2 by 1.5 centimeters extending from the canine to the first molar region. The x-ray shows ground glass appearance of the bone in the concerned area. What would be the surgical treatment? So basically they've given us a clinical scenario over here as well as a radiographic interpretation. So it's a 25 year old female patient and what is the most important part over here is it's a diffuse that means it's not a proper circumscribed lesion it's non-progressive as in it's not an active lesion as such and it's non-tender so this is pretty much clear that it's the swelling of the jaw that is the, the swelling is in the right maxilla and it's in the canine and the first molar region so all we have to focus over here is that it's a non-tender diffuse swelling which is not progressive and the x-ray shows ground glass appearance most of the lesions have a pathognomonic uh, feature. So if you look at this, it's the ground glass appearance. Any idea what it is? It's a pretty much straightforward question if you just look at the ground glass appearance. Can anyone put it in the comments? What is the lesion we're talking about over here? 
Anybody? Pretty much straightforward if you consider it's a bony lesion which has ground glass appearance, it's non tender, it's a fibrosis lesion. Any guesses? Okay, so yeah, it is fibrous dysplasia. That is the diagnosis that we arrive at. So what is the what is the treatment of fibrous dysplasia? I'm not going to go into the details about the pathology part and how does it occur, what does it appear like. But the most important thing for us to realize are these three. First is the ground glass or orange peel appearance. Onset, which is usually in the first or the second decade of life. And it's mostly painless. So that, that is pretty much clear about it. So let us look at the options and see what can be the treatment plan for this. A is total excision of the lesion. B, curettage of the area with the extraction of the involved teeth. C, surgical cosmetic recontouring. D, surgical excision followed by radiotherapy. So there's something I'd like to highlight right now is radiotherapy is absolutely contraindicated in case of fibrous dysplasia. Why? Because it is a lesion where once sub subjected to radiotherapy post-surgery, they can be post-radiation bone sarcoma. So your intervention is actually going to cause a detrimental bone sarcoma as such. So radiotherapy is absolutely contraindicated. So it can't be D. Let's go to the total excision of the lesion. Basically, total excision of the lesion is done when the borders are properly demarcated. Once the borders are diffused, as in the case of fibrous dysplasia, it is not easy for us to know the proper borders. So total excision of the lesion is not possible. Another thing is uh, the lesion has a pattern where it is in two phases, where one phase it is active, where it is actively growing. And in the other phase, it is stable and it is quiescent. Like I said earlier, it is the timing of the surgery that is essential, right? So over here, it is essential for us to know that in adolescence, we are not supposed to uh, go ahead with the surgery. We are just supposed to wait and watch. Because once we finish the surgery in the adolescent age, the lesion might still be active and there can be progression of the disease post-surgery as well. That is why the treatment is supposed to be delayed. Another thing is, when are we supposed to do the treatment in the case of fibrous dysplasia? So what are the cases that you pick? They can be for cosmetic reasons or they can be a functional disability. Most of the cases in case of uh, uh, maxilla or mandible, in case of maxilla, over here, if we take uh, example as right maxilla, functional deformity, as well as they can be encroachment of the vital structures as our maxillary uh, sinus or even the floor of the nose. So these are the important things that we have to take care about. So basically, functional disability and cosmetic reasons are both the indications for us to go ahead with the surgery. So answer for this question is going to be surgical cosmetic decontouring. Is that clear? Just let, it, let me know if there are any doubts and uh, let me show you a picture. So what about the ground glass opacification? If you can see... Yeah, so if you can see over here, this is the right maxilla. So this is the lesion. As you can see, it is not well circumscribed and it's pretty much diffuse. And you can see that it's a ground glass opacification. What is ground glass opacification? That is seen because of superimposition of poorly calcified brony trabeculae. As you can see, it's an opacification and there are poorly calcified bony trabeculae giving rise to this pattern. So I hope... Uh, you'll be able to remember that the ground glass opacification is fibrous dysplasia looking at this picture. It is also called orange peel appearance as well. Okay, then I'll move forward to the next question. Plunging ranula is so called because of... So basically, can anyone tell me what is ranula? I'm not seeing any comments right now, guys. So what is plunging ranula? What is a ranula? Let us start a, let us start with that. So is it a mucus extravasation or mucus retention? Think about it. Okay, there are two things I'd like you to be clear about. What is mucus 
extravasation or retention what is a ranula is it different from mucosal or is it the same anybody willing to answer okay so if we uh, start off with mucus extravasation yeah mucosal is a mucus extravasation lesion and ranula is a type of mucosal that is seen in the floor of the mouth extravasation in the sense there has been a spillage of mucus or saliva due to certain reasons it could be because of trauma as such or any ductal obstruction which could lead to spillage as well so there is mucus extravasation and that is called mucosal and when it is seen mucosal can be seen commonly in the lip as well and when it is seen in the floor of the mouth it is called ranula why is it called a ranula ranula is because of its mucus retention yes the yeah, yeah that's right why is it called ranula any idea why that name has been derived where it is derived from different location wise in the sense mucosal can be seen in other regions as well but ranula is oh, mucosal is called ranula when it is seen in the floor of the mouth okay yeah uh, the correct answer is d but i'd like you to answer why is it called ranula because this is also one of the frequently asked question it's called ranula because it gives the appearance of a frog belly the scientific name yes very good frog belly the scientific name of frog is rana tigrina so that's where it derives its name so plunging ranula in the sense can you tell me why is it called plunging you told me it's extension through mylohyoid right so mylohyoid is the muscle that forms the floor of the mouth so once the floor floor of the mouth is formed by mylohyoid there can be seepage of the fluid of mucus which passes through the mylohyoid and it re reaches which region this is what i'd like you to highlight which region does it what is the region that is below the mylohyoid it's pretty much clear when you read about the triangles of the neck right this is where anatomy comes into part another thing now that we are talking about mylohyoid can anyone tell me what's the origin and insertion of mylohyoid it's pretty much in the name itself anybody I told you it's most important to know about the progress of the disease as well but that is to arrive at a diagnosis and once we start the surgery the most important part is to know the surgical anatomy so the origin and origin and insertion of mylohyoid will help you understand how the disease progresses as well and how you are supposed to approach it as well okay so nobody is going to answer dia junaid i can see only two names okay so origin is pretty much in the name that is the mylohyoid line of the mandible and insertion is to the body of the hyoid bone just remember mylohyoid the first part itself is origin mylohyoid line the second part is the hyoid bone where in the hyoid bone it is the body i'd like you all to go back and look at the origin and insertion of all the muscles your surgical anatomy is pretty much very important so they can just ask you questions uh picture based questions where they just point at one part and you're supposed to know if it's origin or insertion okay insertion is hyoid bone where body of the hyoid bone so if they draw a diagram or if they show you a picture of the hyoid bone you're supposed to identify exactly where okay so now that is clear let me just uh, recap mucus extravasation where the fluid passes through the mylohyoid mylohyoid uh, uh, muscle and it enters the submandibular region so this is exactly where it is and uh, yeah another thing i'd like you to note is a plunging ranula is it seen in the midline or it does it cross the midline or is it seen on one side of the floor of the mouth this is another question that has been asked many times okay and the differential diagnosis of this could be sublingual dermoid as well so this is where you make the difference basically plunging ranula is seen on the one side of the floor of the mouth it usually never crosses the midline okay and it's it's a painless lesion and one more thing that is very important is if you think it's just the color that is important 
one side on the floor of the mouth yes that's right so if you think that it's just the color that is important then you'd be wrong because only this only if the plunging dinula is a little superficial is where you can see the bluish coloration because of the secretions but if it is deep the color color would be normal so just don't uh, generally think if a picture is put up and if you if you see that it is normal in color you can't rule out that it's not a plunging dinula okay it's not necessarily blue in color if it's deep it can be normal color as well it doesn't cross the midline they are uh, it is supposed to be on one side of the floor of the mouth this is very important another thing is it is devoid of epithelial lining okay so what is the treatment for this treatment would be e even if it is superficial or deep it involves a surgical removal of the sublingual gland and the approach would be intraoral as the lesion is intraoral it's pretty much easy for us to access through it and it involves removal of the entire sublingual gland as well okay any doubts let me show you the picture over here so here is the mylohyoid muscle as you can see this is the floor of the mouth and this is the rhinula and this is the mylohyoid muscle and here if it extends beyond this and involves the gland submandibular region it is called plunging rhinula is the picture clear okay let's go ahead now yeah, this is a very simple question, but yet uh, many people tend to make a mistake and it has been asked many times. So here it is. Pars 2 is the name given to A, enucleation, B, marsupialization, C, excision of ranula, D, A and B. So uh, yeah, any guesses? Please put up your answers. What is Pars 2? The answer is not D, Jeanette. See, this is what I was talking about. There are many questions that are pretty. No, that's not the answer. Uh, D is not the answer. So this is what I'm talking about. They are pretty much straight questions. It's not B. Okay. Okay. Let me speak about it. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about. The questions would be pretty much straightforward, but then the options could be a little confusing. So if it is A and B, enucleation and marsupialization, that is not PARSH 1. That's not PARSH 2. Sorry. So uh, what is Waldron's procedure? So there is three things I'd like to make it clear right now. Yeah, the answer is A. Gunjan. Yes. So there are three things I'd like to make it clear right now. PARSH 1. So this is a pretty ancient uh, procedure. So it has been discovered in around uh, 1895 or something. So that is pretty much 19th century. So we have to make it clear that we can't make mistakes because it's pretty old. It's not something new. So PASH 1 procedure is where initial decompression is done followed by marsupialization. Okay. So what is the difference between decompression, marsupialization and enucleation? Any idea? Okay. Let me give away the answer. The answer is A, enucleation. PASH 2 is enucleation. So let me talk about PASH 1. PASH 1 is where decompression and marsupialization is done. Decompression in the sense, as you can see in the name itself, the overlying epithelium bone and deroofing of the cyst is done. So basically, what are you trying to do? You will remove the epithelium bone and deroof the cyst. What happens is once you remove that, you can expel, you can expect that the contents of the cyst to be expelled. So there is deroofing of the bone that is done. What is marsupialization? It's there in the name itself. Marsupium is a pouch. Wait, I have a picture. Let me show it to you. Yeah. So here it is. Uh, as you can see, this is a lesion that is seen in the floor of the mouth. So what have they done over here? They've given an incision and through the mucosa over the dome of the cyst. So this is pretty much a vertical incision that is given. And over here, if you can see, what happens is you want to create an outlet for the contents of the cyst to come out. So for that, what are you going to do? If you suture up the, uh, if you suture up the mucosa and the cyst wall, what is going to happen? There won't be any outlet. So what what happens in case of large cyst is, it will be difficult for you to remove the entire cyst with the lining. So this is what enucleation is. Enucleation is when you try to remove the entire cystic contents along with the, its lining. 
So if it is a smaller cyst, it gets easy for you to remove it. But what if it's a bigger cyst? What happens is the cystic lining, it tends to break on its own and it gets difficult to remove the entire thing as a stretch. So that again causes recurrence, which is most common in cases of jaw uh, cysts over here. So in order to prevent all of it, what you, what you plan to do is, why do you do mass stabilization is, you try to create a pouch. Here what happens is, there is a cystic lining that is inside. There is oral epithelium that is outside. What you try to do is you give an incision, open up the cyst, open up the cyst wall and try to drain whatever contents are there inside, how much ever you can and suture this part that is the cyst lining to the epithelium. Okay. Once you finish that, there is an opening and it forms a pouch which is facing towards the oral epithelium. So it is facing outside. So this is how you expect the cystic contents to be expelled and thereby the size of cyst reduces. Once that is done, it gets easier for you to remove the lining. So that is basically the funda about marsupialization. Okay. So uh, about marsupialization, this is when it is done, when the lesions are pretty long and there is other indications for marsupialization as well. Can anybody tell where you prefer marsupialization instead of enucleation? So it is pretty much clear, right? Pars 2 is just enucleation with the closure, with prim primary closure of the cystic wall. Okay, primary closure of the lesion. Pars 1 is where you do decompression and marsupialization. Again, you're keeping it open, but this is a pr pretty primitive method. There's a third one called Waldron's technique. Okay, these three can be very similar and very confusing, but there are totally different lesions as well, uh, treatment methods as well. So what is Waldron's technique? That is option, which option is it? Option D. So what are you going to do in Waldron's procedure? Like I said before, if there is a huge cyst, what you try to do is you create a pouch and let the contents ex escape. That is marsupialization. Once the cystic, con cystic contents escape and over a period of time, it shrinks in size. It gets easy for you to remove the entire cystic lining. So first what you do in Walden's technique is marsupialization. Let the, let the entire thing shrink very good. Yes, in case of, in case of OKC, actually enucleation is preferred. Okay, uh, I can see your question over there. I'll, I'll get that to you later. I'll get back to that. But in case of large cysts, you start with marsupialization. Let it shrink. And once it shrinks, it gets easier for you to remove the cystic lining and remove. I'll give you another example where mass stabilization is important. Where uh, in younger children, in younger children, if you go for extensive enucleation and you try to do curettage and try to, uh, you know, remove the bone around the cystic cavity, what is going to happen? There is a growing tooth bud. There are unerupted teeth. That's going to affect the growth of the teeth and eruption as well. So in such situations, you can start off with mass stabilization. Okay. And another situation is when when the cyst is pretty much close to vital structures. What are the vital structures for us? In the mandible, it is the canal. And in the maxilla, it is the sinus pretty much and the nasal flow. If it is too close to that and if you try to enucleate or try to do curatage and run your burr around it, then there can be fistula formation. So in such case, in order to pre pre uh, preserve the vital structures, all you have to do is marsupialization. Form an outlet, put a gauze inside, Keep dressing, keep changing the dressings. Once the cyst shrinks in size, then you can remove it on uh, the whole thing. Remove the cystic lining as well. Another important thing is if it is too close to the lower border of the mandible, it can cause, yes, dentigerous the cyst. If it is too close to the lower border of the mandible, once you try to put a burr or an instrument, there are chances of pathological factors. That is, you have to at least have one to two centimeters of proper bone for you to not cause pathologic fractures. So our treatment should be in such a way where we should not do any harm. So in such situations, marsupialization is preferred. If it is not any of this size and if, if it is a smaller cyst and where there is no vital structures around, enucleation is treatment of choice. Okay, so have I made it clear? Do you have any doubts with this sort of treatment over here? Waldron's? Parse 1 and parse 2. Is it clear? If nobody's going to say anything, I'll assume that you've understood everything. Okay?
Okay, going ahead. Treatment of a giant cell lesion 2.5 centimeters in diameter in the mandibular anterior region is. So we're just going to talk about the treatment part of it, okay? A giant cell, a giant cell lesion 2.5 centimeters in diameter. So that's not pretty big as such and it's in the mandibular anterior region. What do you think is the treatment of choice? 2.5 centimeters, do you go for block excision? Or wide radical excision? Electrocautery, do you do electrocautery in a giant cell lesion which is essentially bony? What do you think is the treatment choice over here? I'd like to put in the answer. It's pretty much straightforward as well. A giant cell lesion 2.5 centimeters in the mandibular anterior region. So we don't have to actually worry about uh, uh, lower border integrity and all because 2.5 centimeters is not that big enough. So yes, the answer is plain curettage. So what are you going to do in curettage? You have to make sure that you get the entire bony margin. You have to secure the, it is not C. Gunjan, it's not wide radicular excision that has to be done. White radical excision is done when the lesion is bigger and when there are chances of recurrence or carcinomatous changes are seen as such. But giant cell lesions, most of them are, are safer. I mean, it's easier for us to find the borders. The most important part, let me tell you this here, the most important part of surgery is to define those clear borders. So once it's a giant cell lesion, curatage would pretty much suffice. Why not D? Block excision, uh, yeah, uh, Dia um, Walden, yeah, Walden's technique is marsupialization first followed by enucleation. Okay, it's pretty simple, just try to remember it this way. It's a big cyst. What are you going to do? You want to let it out and shrink the size by enucleation, that's not going to work out. What are you going to do? You open, you make a small pouch and make sure the contents are uh, expelled. And the cyst shrinks in size. That is marsupialization. And then follow. When you want to do surgery, you would, you would want to do an extensive big area surgery or something small which is easier and which is not closer to the any of the vital structures. Obviously this. So, mars, yeah, Waldron's is marsupialization. First, then enucleation. And D is not the answer for this question because block excision, you have to do block excision. In the sense, you're going to do something which is like segmental segmental resection when is it going to happen when lower borders are involved okay so when you look at the diameter it's not that huge okay a giant cell lesion pretty much a curatage would be more than enough okay yeah so uh this is another important question which of the following is treated with carnoids after enucleation so once we spoke about enucleation, enucleation is the treatment of choice for OKC, but enucleation can be done along with curettage and enucleation can be done once you finish that. What, like I said, we can place a pack that is inside. We can even do that placement of a pack where dressings can be changed. Basically, you can put iodoform based uh, uh, pack and the pack can be changed. So that uh, the cystic contents also can be treated. But uh, uh, wait a second. Uh, giant cyst. It's a giant cell lesion. If you do curatage, then kind of recurrence occur. Okay. So I'd like you to go back and read about giant cell giant cell lesions and their recurrence. Okay. Gunjan. Yeah. What are the lesions that uh, that have highest rate of recurrence and Look at the giant cell lesions as well. Okay. Yes. Very good. Next uh, next time I'm going to ask you this question in the next session because we'll be continuing with tumors odontogenic and non-odontogenic tumors next session as well. So just go back and read up about that. You'll have a very clear idea. Okay. Okay. So now coming back to Carnoy solution. So what is Carnoy solution? Carnoy solution. Why is it used in case of... Yeah. So can anyone answer? Which question? Uh, yeah. So, what do you think is the answer? OKC, odontogenic myxoma, ABC, that is aneurysmal bone cyst, or amyloblastoma. So, basically, Carnoy solution is contraindicated in pretty much all of the lesions because 
uh, as such what it does is it destroys the cells okay that's what it actually does even the bone cells and skin because the pe uh, penetration not, not just the skin yeah skin also because when you apply it you have to be very careful so it is pretty much yeah okay see is the answer so let's just look about uh, kana solution this is also yeah so what does it do kana solution ka this is another important thing they'll ask you about the ratio that is 6 is to 3 is to 1 ratio so basically it has uh, ethanol chloroform and glacial acetic acid in these ratios and ferric chloride is also added so this is another important question what is the depth of penetration most important for us when dealing yes most most important for us is dealing with the bone okay so immediately that is imagine five minutes there is a depth of penetration of 1.5 mm and 1.8 mm after one hour so we have to be very careful while applying the solution so most most important is you have to remove these uh, remember these numbers and you have to be able to remove it after a certain point of time Kanas is something you have to wash out okay any more doubts on this and it is absolutely contraindicated in other re regions as well and you can't leave it out it is something that is supposed to be washed out okay what we are going to do is basically carnoise is a chemical cauterization so what you do you try to remove the cystic walls and in few of the cystic cases as in okc it can be very fragile so there might be little remnants that is left out for that what we do is once we finish our surgery as in once we start scooping off all all the uh, particles uh, as in all the fragile tissues and the cystic lining what will be left will be few cells and a little debris that has to be chemically cauterized using a carnoid solution okay yeah so the next question somebody has already answered uh dia so i'd like you to tell me what is the percentage of recurrence of okc and uh, maybe just dentigerous resist just tell me that and we can move ahead and there is something else that we have to talk about uh why is there a highest rate of recurrence in okc We've already spoken about the treatment for OKC. So let's just, uh, the reason I've included this is, this is most important for us. We have to be careful about recurrence, which is why we had carnoids in the previous slide, okay? So we can't avoid that step. Carnoids, you have to remember for OKC, highest rate of recurrence, which is around how much percent? Daughter cysts in OKC, very good. Ep epithelium, yeah. Yeah, this is also very important. Once you uh, once you realize that the epithelium is very fragile, I can tell you by experience, it pretty much breaks. There is no way you can try to take it out as whole, as in case of mucosal or epidermoid cyst. Epithelium is very fragile, 13%, it's, it's pretty much higher. Okay, I'll give you a range. In case if they give you an option, I'll give you a range. It's something about between 25 to 60%. So that's pretty much high. Near to 90% is you're being too uh, negative about the surgery. But then, yeah, it again depends on the surgeon and how they perform. But it's something between, yeah, 25 to 60%. Just remember that it's pretty high, around 60% as well. So once, uh, see, this is what it is. If there is no recurrence rate, you will just have pretty much one or two surgeries. Options. But once there is high recurrence rate, that's when they're bringing all, all the chemical cauterization and all of that. So remember, OKC, highest recurrence rate, around 25 to 60%, which is why enucleation, when you do, you have to remove the lining, which is important, and use chemical cauterization, okay? Other methods that are used are, you can use drains and all, which is a little bit higher level for you guys. So just remember that much. And yes, daughter cysts. So this can also be asked, why is it, why is there higher recurrence? I'm seeing very inconsistent answers over here. That's because it's pretty much higher recurrence. But just remember, it's the highest, okay? Dentigerous cyst as such has also got uh, high recurrence rate, but not as much as this. It is something around 25 to 27% dentigerous cyst, but OKC is higher. Okay, is that clear? Is it okay if we perform mass uh for uh, odontogenic keratosis, is it? See, again, what are you going to do? You want to try to shrink the lesion. 
try to shrink the lesion. That's what you're talking about, right? But then again, the chances, once you uh, open it up, what are the chances of recurrence? The best way to perform this. Again, see, let me tell you something. Enucleation is the treatment of choice over here, with provided you're doing it with chemical cauterization. You can try to perform marsupialization only when it is closer to vital structures. Even then, you can still prefer enucleation, okay? Marsupialization is, like I said, it's a little primitive method. That is the reason they developed enucleation and it is combined with so many other things as well, like I said. Is it clear? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Enucleation, there is, there shouldn't be any more confusion after this. Okay, say go for enucleation. Don't think about marsupialization. Unless it is closer to vital structures, nobody is going to ask you that question. Okay. Uh, moving on. An empty cavity in the mandible with no lining is most likely to be. So over here, it is pretty simple. It's empty cavity. And, uh, and this particular cyst has no lining. This is also straight. Can you guys try to guess? straightforward. So now that we came to this question, why I have included this is you're supposed to know which of the cysts have lining, which don't and empty cavity as in what is the kind of aspirate. Okay. ABC is not the right answer. Aneurysmal bone cyst. It's not the right answer. Can you think about it? It's just the opposite of that. Yes, C is right. Can anyone tell me uh, what are the other names of aneurysmal, I mean, uh, traumatic? Okay, I pretty much gave away the answer. So which is traumatic bone cyst? And which is hemorrhagic bone cyst? Can anyone tell me the synonyms? It's not dentigerous cyst, Priya. Denti okay, if you're going to say that, then I'll have to ask this question. What is the aspirate of a dentigerous cyst can you tell me yes idiopathic bone cyst is traumatic bone cyst as well as hemorrhagic bone cyst so uh yeah and another thing i'd like to stress right now is you need to know the pathogenesis of this that's when you'll be able to understand why the cavity is empty okay go back and read about that and i'd like uh, dia to tell me what is the Aspirate of a dentigerous cyst. What does it look like? Can you tell me? Okay, let me give away the answer for this. It is idiopathic bone cyst. So pretty much an empty cavity in the mandible and no lining. All things point to idiopathic bone cyst. So let me show you this slide. Types of aspirate and diagnosis. I think pretty much all the basic textbooks have a very detailed uh, tables. When it comes to the type of aspirate and diagnosis, this is very, very important. So that is why I'd like you to note this right now. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Idiopathic bones is systematic. Yeah. Yellowish aspirate. Okay. So look at this. Clear, pale, straw color fluid with cholesterol crystals. See, again, this is very important in... Uh, I think it will be dealt in oral pathology as well, cholesterol crystals. But most important thing for us to, is to know the aspirate because after that we can arrive at a diagnosis and go ahead with the treatment. So this is what is important. Pale, straw colored, dentigerous, creamy white, the cheesy that you're talking about, odontogenic cyst. Okay, yellowish, foul smelling is infected cyst. Another thing is most of the cysts in the starting stages are pretty much painless. But once it starts getting infected, it will be pretty much painful. Okay. Starting stages is usually painless. They won't even present in the starting stages. But later when they have pain or swelling is when patients come and present to us. Blood. In case uh, if it's a vascular lesion. And this is, this is the question that I asked. Air. So it is an empty cavity. You tried to aspirate it and nothing came out of it. It is a traumatic bone. So it's pretty much clear. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Radiographic examination is useful in detection of all these lesions except. So this is very important in the sense uh, 
you can pretty much diagnose all of the cysts in the routine examination itself radiographic examination but there is one region that is very tricky and which one is that and i'd like you to answer answer is d residual cyst residual cyst is pretty easy to diagnose because what is a residual cyst do you see a teeth over there an association with it answer is c yes nasoalveolar cyst can someone tell me what are the other names for nasoalveolar cyst it's a very uh, yeah it's a very fascinating name nasoalveolar nasolabial or cleistat cyst have you heard of the name cleistat cyst yes no okay let me go ahead then so nasoalveolar cyst nasoalveolar cyst is the one it's not d the answer is c nasoalveolar cyst cleistat cyst look at any of the basic textbooks they have mentioned this so they can directly put that name and try to confuse you one thing you have to be clear about all the time is you need to know all the other synonyms because questions can be pretty much straightforward but then it can be the synonyms that can confuse you okay so let me tell you about uh, nasoalveolar cyst it is undetected by routine radiographic examination that is pretty much clear by this but why it's it's a totally soft tissue lesion entirely and it is painless and we'll never get to know unless it is secondarily infected so when you just take an exam uh, during routine examination if you just take an iopr you might think it's just a normal cyst but what is a normal cyst as in can be a periapical cyst or something of that sort uh yes junaid but the spelling is a little wrong you're almost right okay so how does nasoalveolar cyst occur basically there are many theories but uh, the most popular theory says that it is because of the proliferation of the nasoalveolar duct okay so what how do you detect this this is something i'll i'll run through pretty quickly try to pay attention right now okay so how do you diagnose this uh, diagnose it because if you just take routine examination it might look like a normal cyst how do you know if it is nasoalveolar or not what they do is it's something called cystography what what will be done is the fluid contents has to be aspirated out and we in inject a radio opaque contrast dye so once you apply the dye what happens is when once you take a ct or mri or any of the uh, radiographs what happens is this contrast helps us to determine the margins that's when you can uh, decide what is the extent of the lesion the most important thing for a surgery is to know the extent of the lesion once we don't know that we can't even proceed with it so this cystography is what is important for us okay and obviously other uh, confirmatory diagnosis is going to be histopathology okay is it clear and yeah let me tell you a small thing what is the treatment for this also it's going to be surgical enucleation once you make sure that you have a proper borders you just go ahead with enucleation this is another slide that i've included over here it is the uh, classification of cysts so this is something you have to be pretty pretty thorough because they can confuse you with uh, just saying developmental inflammatory odontogenic and non odontogenic so you have to be pretty clear about it because few of the characters can be prototype and few of the treatment can also be prototype like non epithelial over here that is the question that i asked previously which doesn't have an epithelial lining and all of that okay so once this is clear they can try to twist the question just based on this classification i'm pretty sure pretty much uh, all of you would have read about this but then keep practicing this okay this is something you should not forget it looks pretty easy in the first go but if you just ask point at one thing you might still be confused okay yeah and uh, yeah multiple bilateral dentigerous cysts are seen in so this is something the syndromes that are very important for us when you directly look at it what do you think is the answer there are two syndromes that are very important when it comes to the cyst what are those d is not right golden gauze is seen in which cyst pachi no see i that's what that's what i'm talking about these are the ones that are pretty confusing golden gauze is seen in case of okc 
it's a pretty huge i think there's a table in pretty much every textbook so if you look at it you can see yeah p is the right answer yeah okay see so when you see that it's a cyst and there's a question about the syndromes pretty much everybody go for golden gods many people have done this but the answer is matolemi syndrome so that is mucopolysaccharidosis type 6 okay so bilateral most of the times you see dentigerous cysts that are uni uh, uh i mean unilateral you see it only on one side but bilateral is something that is very rare which is why it can be asked it is seen in two conditions one is mato lamy syndrome and cleidocranial dysplasia okay yeah and now that we are at this i want you to go back and read about gollingot syndrome okay and god's gollin cyst as well go and read about that okay yeah uh yeah this is another case scenario a 30 year old male patient reports with a swelling at the right angle of the mandible radiograph shows an impacted third molar associated with multilocular radiolucency okay so this is the question uh this is just a uh, yeah a radiograph over here so you can see it's in the angled region this is just an example it's not related to the question over there so i just like you to appreciate the multilocular uh radiolucency that is seen okay protein content less than 4 grams per 100 ml the lesion is likely to be so this is a very important question that has been asked pretty much many times okay that's been repeated also so the protein content which is less than 4 grams is i'm looking at the answers okay yes okay see is the answer so if it is more than 4 grams yeah if it is more than 4 grams per 100 ml what is it it's pretty simple you don't have to get confused less than 4 grams is okay see greater than 4 grams is what it's a dentigerous cyst another question that can be asked is yes yes that's right another question that can be asked is if it is less than 4 grams per 100 ml what is the main protein content majority of okc is formed by albumin that is the protein okay i'd like you to note down this one less than 4 grams per per 100 ml is okay see and majority of the content is formed by albumin yes okay coming to the uh, last question what is the appropriate treatment option so we spoke about this i already gave you the answer like a couple of times so what is the treatment option for okc see here they didn't ask us about the proximity and this is a picture that i have put in so that you will have an idea but then what is the treatment option if they straight away put up a question like this enucleation marginal mandibulectomy segmental resection hemi mandibulectomy so are you guys clear with all of this terminology or do you want me to explain about them yes enucleation is the answer like i said before but what about option b c and d do you have an idea when it should be done what is marginal marginal mandibulectomy what is segmental resection what is hemi mandibulectomy the answer is a enucleation okay i'll go ahead and explain what is marginal marginal mandibulectomy so if you can see over here it is pretty much close yeah i'll explain that so if you can see here it is pretty much close to the lower border so what are we supposed to do if we try to put an instrument over here obviously there is going to be a break over here so what would be the treatment option over here uh, i mean how much ever you try to maintain the continuity of the lower border that is not going to work out so what will you do here is where we try to do segmental resection okay this is pretty much close to the uh, posterior border as well but let's just think that the lesion ends over here not the complete extension till here okay let's just think that the lesion ends over here and it's pretty much closed what you do is you try to preserve the angle and just resect this part of it including the lower border so an entire segment is going to be out this entire segment 
that is called segmental another example the other one is marginal mandibulectomy imagine if two to uh, two to yeah two to three centimeters of the lower border integrity is maintained and the lesion is only till here imagine a lesion till here what are you going to do you just leave the lower part and excise the entire lesion you do the entire resection over here and this part in the continuity of the lower border is maintained what is that called marginal mandibulectomy okay so in marginal mandibulectomy you leave around two to okay one to two centimeter margin in the lower border okay and in segmental you sacrifice the lower border as well because as you can see over here it is pretty much close okay the last one segmental resection in amyloblastoma yes i will uh, i will deal about uh, amyloblastoma in the next case but yes it can be performed it depends on the extent of the lesion and its uh, vitality i mean uh, how close it is to the vital structures as well so let me come to the last one most of the cases i'll tell you something amyloblastoma it is it is going to be pretty uh, the the spread is going to be pretty uh, in the anterior posterior direction so what happens is you might have to go for hemibandibulectomy also so that's an example if it comes to oh thank you so much <laughs> yeah so what happens is you have to do hemimandibulectomy imagine okay here you can see that the posterior border is already compromised the inferior border is also compromised but just imagine if this extent comes still here what you have to do you have to do hemimandibulectomy the coronoid and condyla process also have to be removed okay because if the lesion is that big understood but if nobody is going to talk about the size of the lesion and if they just say it's a swelling in the right angle of the mandible then straight away go for enucleation don't even think about anything else okay so that's pretty much it uh, thank you guys if there are any questions just put it in the comment section and uh, in the next session we will go ahead with uh, yeah uh, odontogenic and non odontogenic tumors uh, yes any other doubts you can put it up in the comment session i'll i'll try to clear them out and yes uh, i'd like to i'd like you to go back and read about giant cell lesions as well i'll try to include few questions in the next session we'll basically deal about uh, amyloblastoma okay i'm not going to talk about pathology you guys have to be very clear about that we're just going to talk about what type of treatment has to be done in what sort of cases okay and i'd like you guys to have uh, give me some feedback as well if you want me to add more pictures or if you want me to draw something just let me know we can make the next session uh, better Anything else? Nothing? Has it has everything been clear? <laughs>